Welcome to one of your flip lectures. Today we're going to talk about economics. I'm going to introduce you to some of the concepts that you first read about in your reading. And so the first question is, what is economics? And to kind of break it down in a way so you can understand it, economics is the study of the production, distribution, and consumption of wealth. Basically, this is how a society, and we as individuals, value and distribute the scarce resources. We live in a world with limited resources and unlimited human wants. So when we talk about economics, what we're going to be talking about are resources, natural resources such as wood or human resources, such as a computer engineer who knows how to write software. Also, we're talking about exchanging goods and services for other goods and services. For instance, you can trade a sandwich for a cookie. That'd be exchanging goods. It also has to deal with employment, like jobs. And then finally, economics deals with quality of life and the access to resources that ordinary people are going to have. So I want to start talking about some definitions of what economics is. And economic deals with a concept called material life. And material life is how we do things. These are the routine tasks that we have to do in order to survive. Most of us simply call this work. And so material life has to do with how we carry out these tasks. And so material life can be tools, such as a hammer or a computer or the internet that helps you do your job at work. It, but this also deals with the tasks that we need to survive, such as consumption. And so material life deals with the kinds of food and the quality of food that you eat, the way that you go to the bathroom from indoor plumbing or an outhouse, and really anything that you consume. This deals with entertainment, transportation, all of those things. Those are all considered material life. So start thinking of some examples outside of the ones I've given you of what material life might be like. A large part of the study of economics is looking at how material life changes over time. As you can see from these pictures, they're both completing the same task, namely planting and harvesting crops, agriculture. On the left, you see two guys with a wooden plow carried by two oxen. That, those were tools that were very advanced for their time. But then if you look at the other picture, you can see that now these tasks are, tasks are carried out by large machines that are highly efficient and only need one person to operate. And so material life, the way we do things, changes over time significantly. Even how we communicate with each other is a part of material life, the way we communicate in order to carry out our everyday lives. On the left, you can see, if you want to communicate with people, normally you had to write a letter and have that letter sent, and it took sometimes a very long time in order for that letter to reach someone. Nowadays, material life has changed to include the internet, which connects us like never before. Now, via Twitter or Facebook, you can communicate with somebody immediately over the internet, and that has completely changed the way that we live our lives and carry out our day-to-day -day tasks. The goods we consume have also changed significantly over time. You can see on the left is a well. You used to have to go to a well and have a bucket in order to get water. Now we sell 15 different types of bottled water in our stores. So material life, the way that we consume water, has changed significantly in human history. So there's material life. And then the other part of economics is the study of economic life. What economic life is... It studies market activity. It's a very fancy phrase, but what it means is that it measures the social relationship of the exchange of goods and services between individuals or groups. Merchants and consumers, sellers and buyers, business agreements and contracts, as well as the rules and laws that govern how those exchanges can take place. For instance, you see at the top, it's a market where these two women are going to exchange goods and services and carry out a transaction in a marketplace. The bottom picture is the stock market, another place where people buy and sell goods and sometimes buy and sell pieces of businesses. More on that later. And you also might notice that when you buy something, you have to pay taxes on it. 
Well, those taxes are part of the rules and the laws that govern our economic life. How we buy things, how we sell things, those social relationships of the exchange of goods and services. So economics looks at how economic life changes, how our relationships of business change. And the main theme of this is called enlargement where literally it's just the creation of bigger and more economic relationships. The idea is that if you have an iPhone, it was dreamed up by a company in California, it was made in China, it was shipped overseas, and then it was finally sold in a store in Chicago. And so the globalized world kind of represents this enlargement of the entire world into a big economic system. Back in the day, it was Marco Polo who set up trade routes with the Chinese that brought all of those goods into Europe. And today, that is all around us. So some examples of how economic life changes. A long time ago, pretty much, pretty much most humans lived in small, self-sustaining farming villages and communities where they grew food, and then basically you ate the food that was grown in your small community without really much thought about what was beyond it. Then you have the development of the first cities. London, in England, you have Paris, France, and then also in the Americas, you start to have large cities develop, where now trade is not just in a village, but now trade starts to include people who are further and further out. So for instance, in London, there wasn't a whole lot of food being grown, and so they had to buy their food from the farmlands that surrounded the city. And honestly, our day right now, our current day, represents kind of the culmination of this change, this expansion. Because now we have cities that almost no food is produced. So how do you in Chicago get food? Well, somebody who grows the food sells it and ships it to Chicago so that you can eat your food. Also, Chicago and China, they actually have similar markets. Things that can be manufactured in China, and they can be sent to Chicago in order to be sold. Likewise, things made in Chicago are sold in China. So the idea is that as economic life changes, so too does our experiences with buying and selling goods. So examples of global markets. iPhones are made in China. You can buy Coke in every country of the world. So when you think about the made in China label or that Coke bottle that's in a different thing or the Jaritos that is Hecho in Mexico, these are global markets. And these are economic systems that have changed over time to get bigger and include more people and more goods. So how does all this work? It's a really good question. And the way it works in the United States is with an idea called capitalism. And what capitalism is, is it is an economic system, so a way of, ex of exchanging goods and services, that has free enterprise and free markets. So free enterprise is the ability to start and to run your own business with minimal interference from the government. Now, there are reasonable limits on this, and there are laws that govern who can have a business and it has to be safe and things like that. But you don't have to go to the government to ask permission to start a business. If you have an idea, you are free to create a business around that idea. That's the, that is what free enterprise means. And then capitalism is also characterized by what is known as free markets. And in a free market, prices are set freely based on supply and demand. So you may notice the price of things changes. Hot chips cost 25 cents, then 50 cents, then 75 cents, then back to 50 cents. And that's because the government does not set a price of hot chips. The company looks at supply and demand, and that's how they determine how much something should cost. So businesses are free to set their own prices for their goods. So let's talk about what free enterprise looks like. Free enterprise means that people are able to set up companies that they think they can make money with. A good local example would be local restaurants, such as Casa de Pueblo or El Milagro or any of those places, because in those situations, people set up a restaurant in order to produce and sell their food. The government of the United States didn't tell them, oh, you should set up this restaurant. They decided that they had good food and they could probably sell it and make money. 
Another good example of free enterprise is Bill Gates, you can see at the bottom, very young Bill Gates, setting up Microsoft. It was a computer company that they started in a garage, and then based on the idea that a personalized computer would be a very big selling product, they developed the computer, computers and computer software and ended up turning into Microsoft, the huge company that it is today. Also, if you ever watched Shark Tank, all of those individuals on that show came up with an idea they thought could make money, and they were free to do that and establish their business. So here's what free markets mean. What free markets are, are that companies are free to either succeed or fail. So what a free market means is that your business can either make money or it can go bankrupt, and that is the risk that you take starting a business. Free markets always mean that there's going to be a disparity between wealth, between the wealthy and the impoverished. Competition for scarce resources means that there's always going to be rich and poor. An example of this competition would be if two people opened a hot dog stand on the same street. Chances are only one of them is going to be able to stay in business. And then finally in a free market, supply and demand ends up setting the prices of all goods. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So let's talk about supply and demand. Let's imagine that Mr. Moeller is in the front of class and I have six cookies. I'm sure that all of you would want one of these cookies. So let's say there's 25 of you in the class, but there's only six cookies. This means that I only need to get six of you to buy one of my cookies. And so I ask who will pay me a dollar. Maybe all 25 hands go up. Then I can say two dollars. Maybe some of your hands go down and you no longer want to pay that much for a cookie. But I can keep raising the price until less than six people want to buy it. Kind of an interesting idea that I can set my own price. Also, if I have 100 cookies to sell, in order to sell all of my cookies, I have to get each of you to buy more than one cookie. You each have to buy four cookies in order for me to sell them. So, in order to get you to buy more cookies, I'm going to lower my prices. So, where you might have bought one cookie for a dollar, now I'm going to offer you two for a dollar. So, now you might buy two. So, the amount of cookies I have, the supply, and the amount of people who want cookies, the demand are going to determine the price of my goods. And this is visually how we can tell how prices are going to change based on the amount of something that there is and the amount of people who want to buy it. So this is a really neat chart. This quantity down here represents the amount of something that I have, the quantity. So in this case, let's say cookies, the amount of cookies that I have. Over here is the price where I'm going to determine how much I can charge for these cookies and still be able to sell them all. So let's say that first I'm going to only have six cookies. So we'll say six cookies are right there. Now in order to find out how much I'm going to be able to sell them for, I draw a line up here to the demand line where quantity, the supply, is going to meet the demand. So I know that I can charge a pretty high price because I only have a few to sell. And I can probably get at least six of you to pay more than $2 for a cookie. But now let's say I have 100 cookies. So let's put that over here. In order to sell all 100 of these cookies, when there's still only 25 of you, I have to lower my price significantly. So we see we can come over here. And that is the price that I can charge in order to sell all of my cookies. We can go over this more in class, and we will, but this is a visual representation about how prices go up and down based upon how much of something you have and how many people want to buy it. But what else goes into the price of things that you buy? Supply and demand is one thing, but you cannot sell a product for less than you made it for, otherwise you will lose money. So you have to factor in the cost of materials. How much did the flour, the chocolate chips, all those stuff, how much did that stuff cost me? How much do I pay per cookie? And that has to go into my price. It has to be more than that. But it also has to be more than those cost of materials and my labor costs because I have to pay somebody to make my cookies. 
I also have to pay someone to transport my cookies. I have to pay taxes on my cookies. So there are a lot of different expenses that go into a product. And so there's a need to make a profit. So you take the amount that it costs you to make, and you have to charge more than that in order to make money. So let's back it up for a second. Let's ask the question, what is the market? Because I'm going to talk about the market a lot, and it might be a bit confusing for you. But the market is a little bit like the matrix. The market is all around you. It is with you when you go to work. You are in it when you go to the grocery store. You are in it when you watch TV and you go online and you play your video games. You are a part of the market. Because what the market is, it is the system that we trust to replenish our survival. Basically, the idea is that in we trust this system, this negotiation, these market forces in order to make sure that we have what we need to survive and live. And so what the market is, the market is your workplace where you go and work and you get paid for that work. But without you at that job, a task is not getting done that needs to get done in order for us to live the way that we do. And so the market is also the advertisements that get you to buy products. Because when you buy a product, you're participating in the market. And so the market is really all around us. And if we want more examples of the market, we can talk about it more in class. But let me talk about the forces of the market real quick. The market is everywhere. But the forces of the market are that the individual buyers and sellers will produce and sell goods and services that are valuable to people who are going to buy them. That is that farmers create food both to feed themselves, but also to sell the extra food in order to pay for housing and gasoline and television and all these other things. Grocery stores are set up to provide people with access to food because people who don't grow their own food, like Mr. Moeller, I'm going to buy my food. And so a grocery store, in order to meet the need that I'm willing to pay money for food, they set themselves up to, to sell me that food. Also, factories produce cars and other vehicle products that people need to trans for transport themselves, both for business and just because. Also, lawyers give people legal advice. It's something that people need. So the idea here is that the market, the individual, the individual people who create businesses and set up these exchanges, they're going to find out what is valuable to people and they're going to find a way to sell it to them. So then ultimately, businesses, they provide both goods and services to people. So think about if you can come up with a couple of examples for what is the market. So to put it another way, maybe a little bit more simply, is that a market system is a society that's going to connect a lot of different people and places together for economic purposes, the idea of exchanging goods and services. If, you're, if you've been confused, hang on. I'm going to give you guys a really great example in order to underline my point here. So think about the grocery store. You walk into the store and you walk down the cookie and chip aisle. You have an unbelievable amount of choice here because it's been proven that people don't want to eat the same type of chip. So companies make different kinds of chips in order to get you to buy their chip. But re And so you walk down the aisle and you see all these different things. You see Haritos that are from Mexico. You see Florida orange juice. You see the bag of Cheetos. You, ha you see corn. You see California grapes. All these very different products from very different places are all brought into one spot where you can purchase them. Because you have a demand. You want all of these products. And so here's just a few groups who are connected in this market system that can make money off of you by selling you a bag of hot chips. First off are the farms and the farmers, the people who grow the potatoes, the peppers, and all the spices and all the different things that go into the ingredients of the hot chips. Then there's the logistics people, the people who actually buy and transport the potatoes and the spices from the farmers and sell them to the chip company. So you have transportation. You have warehouses of produce. You also have wholesaling of potatoes to the chip company. 
Then there's a factory that actually makes the chips, and there's a separate factory that probably makes the plastic bags that those chips come in. So in order to even get the chips to you, there's now... There's now a factory that is going to actually produce these chips and turn those raw materials, those potatoes and spices, into the bag of chips. Then there's logistics again. You have to take the finished product, the bag of chips, and you have to ship it all over the world in the United States so that you guys can go into the grocery store, Cermak Fresh Produce or whatever it is, and you go into that grocery store and all that food is there for you. Then... Whoever you work for or your parents work for in order to get the money to buy the chips, they're a part of this system too. Because because of them, you have the money in order to buy the chips. And when you're done, we need sanitation workers to dispose of the empty bag when you are done with your chips. So as you can see, bag of chips, the market system exists so that you can have your bag of chips as long as you have the money to pay for it. But here's the scary thing about all this. There's no one making sure that any of this happens. Hot chips could be gone tomorrow and they could never be back. No one is making sure that any of this stuff happens. No one makes sure the farmer grows food. No one is making sure that someone will transport it. No one's making sure that they're getting turned into chips or that any of this is really happening. It's a little bit scary when you think about it, that it all just kind of happens. There's no control. There's no one overseeing it. There's nobody making sure that all of these things happen. No one in a free capitalist society is forced to make or buy anything. If everybody in the chain that provides you with food, from the farmer to the transportation to the grocery store, decided not to do those things... You would not be able to live in Chicago because there would not be any food. All of these people choose of their own free will to provide these goods and services for other people. Pretty scary stuff. So you may ask yourself, why would people do this? Well, it's not just out of the goodness of their heart. The reason that people do this is something called the profit motive. And the profit motive says that people in a free society are going to be driven to make money. That people are going to find a way to produce something or offer services to people who want it in order to sell it to them. It's the idea that if people want apples, someone is going to find a way to get apples and sell it to them. And people, as individuals, they're also going to be trying to become more skilled so that their labor is worth more and you can have a higher salary. This is why we talk about college a lot to you guys. And then ultimately, this means that where there is a need or a want, at least one person is probably going to be motivated to provide it. And the other thing that holds us all together is competition. Not everybody is going to be able to set up the same business. Sometimes there are two hot dog stands. Well, they're going to compete for limited resources. They're they're going to compete for the people who eat hot dogs. And the nice thing about competition is that on the downside, it means that sometimes businesses go bankrupt. People lose their jobs. But competition also spurs innovation, improvement, and diversification. The idea is that you always need a competitive advantage. So maybe you invent the next kind of chip, or you invent the new application or the new way of doing something. Or you find a way to bring your costs down so that your product is cheaper. Or you simply just make different products, or you make them better. good example of this is all the different brands and types of chips that you can see in the grocery store. And so because of the profit motive, economics really looks at incentives. Incentives are, are, is one of my favorite words. And what an incentive is, it's how you force someone to do something without actually, sorry, how to get someone to do something without actually forcing them to do it. The idea is that you offer them something that they want, and then you give them a task in order to complete it. So the idea is that If you guys get paid for work, which you all do, it goes to your tuition, that is your incentive to work because you get paid. Or in my class, your incentive to study is to get good grades and have an opportunity to go to college. We'll talk more about incentives throughout the year, but just want to make sure that we know what it means. 
So the American economy is a capitalist economy, and we're going to talk about what that means further throughout the year. And it's a capitalist society, but it's not completely free markets or free enterprise. There is some regulation and government intervention into economics, and we're going to talk about how that has played out and changed throughout the course of U.S. history. But if you notice, restaurants have to be inspected by a health inspector to make sure that nobody gets sick, and there are many other regulations as well. So to reiterate, capitalism is the economic system with free enterprise and free markets. But capitalism has three main characteristics that you guys read about for homework already. And the three characteristics are this. Capitalism is oriented to the continual accumulation of material wealth as capital. Under capitalism, the production and distribution of wealth is entrusted to the market mechanism. And finally, capitalism creates a new division between economic and political activity. So that's kind of a mouthful. And it's like, whoa, Mr. Mueller, what does all this stuff mean? Well, here's what it means. That first characteristic talks about the idea of capital. And what capital is, it's a form of wealth used to create more wealth. The, have you ever heard the phrase, you got to spend money to make money? That's what capital means. So capital can be money, or it can be machines or tools that are used to produce goods or services, or it could be raw materials like chemicals, steel, oil, that can be used to create new products. So the idea is that in capitalism, you want to gather resources, whether it be money, tools, or materials, that you can use in order to make new products that you can then make money off of. So the idea is that capitalism, you want to have more capital so that you can create even more wealth. And this also means that capitalism is going to be expansive. The pursuit of wealth and capital are going to always drive businesses towards growth. You're always going to try to make a more of a product and you're going to try to make it better because you want to make as much money as possible. Think about how many new cell phone models there are. Apple comes out with a new phone every single year. Think about all the new flavors of food that you can find and all the new products. And also capitalism, because of this, drives change and change drives capitalism. The pursuit of new products always requires invention and innovation, like the invention of the computer or the use of the internet, the way that we use it today. Even Thomas Edison, the inventor, said that basically he invented things in order to create businesses to sell his inventions. And so new inventions can change the way that businesses are run, can connect markets like the internet, and it can even create entire new industries such as online sales. And so really, the weird thing about capitalism is that crisis is what drives capitalism. Because crisis always leads to change, which, in capitalism, is a good thing. So next, we have characteristic number two. And we talk about that all of this stuff, the production distribution of wealth, is entrusted to the market mechanism. Here's what this basically means. We rely upon individuals to make free choices to produce and sell or buy goods at whatever prices they decide they basically agree to both sell for and to pay for. And so the profit motive says that people are going to produce things that other people want and need so that they can actually sell these products and make money. So, for instance, the farmer is going to grow food because he knows that Mr. Moeller is going to buy his food because I don't grow any by myself. And so in capitalism, the government doesn't tell farmers to grow food. Farmers have to choose to grow food because they believe that they can sell it to people like Mr. Moeller and probably you guys. Then finally, the third characteristic, capitalism creates division between economic and political activity. So in history, political and economic activity are linked. Governments controlled the use of resources, and made sure certain things were made. Good examples of this would be ancient Egypt, where the pharaoh and the pharaoh's kind of decrees determined what was grown, how people worked, and it also, they would tell them, you know, build these big monuments, all these things. But capitalism means that business people, merchants, traders, are the real connectors between people. Not some big empire like the Roman Empire that's held together with soldiers and political power. But in capitalism, these connections are held up for the sole purpose 
of making money, of exchanging goods and services between different groups, different places. And then finally, this means that there's economic freedom, that the government does not control or plan the economy, that individuals are free to create and expand their wealth outside of the control of the government. So the government does not tell you what you have to buy, does not tell you what to produce, does not tell you what job to work. You have to choose how you are going to participate in the economic life, the ability for you to carry on the tasks that basically help you survive. So how is American capitalism going to be different than other systems? There's a couple of things that are going to set it apart. The first is that the government does not plan things in the economy. Remember, no one is making sure that all that corn is grown. Next, the government does not control all the resources and all the land in the country. There's private property ownership where you can buy and own a piece of land or resources or kind of whatever it is. Also, government is not the primary broker of trade and the creation of wealth. More wealth is created by individuals in a capitalist system than is created by the government. Then finally, in capitalism, wealth, money you make, is used to reinvest and actually create more wealth. So this American system is different than, say, ancient Egypt under the pharaohs, where the pharaoh pretty much controlled and owned all the property and directed the people as to how they should use their resources. This is also different than communism, in which a government centrally plans the entire economy. So the government would tell you your job and what to do, and that is how the, a communist society would make sure that the tasks that need to get done would get done. So to contrast that real quick, you have the Chicago skyline. In P Egypt, you had the pyramids that the pharaoh decreed that the pyramids should be built. But in Chicago, you have the Sears Tower, I guess it's the Willis Tower now, and all those skyscrapers that the government did not plan or build. Individuals who saw that they could build a large building and make profit from renting out space in it, those were the people who built those large buildings. Also, this is a Volkswagen factory. It's a car factory. And so the government does not own this factory that's making cars. A private company built this factory and manufactures these cars because they believe that they can sell them to other people. But the idea here is that people are free to create things in a capitalist society. So these are kind of the big questions about economics we're going to look at this year. We're going to look at how material life has changed and what the consequences of that change was. We're also going to look at economic life and the causes and consequences of those changes. And then finally, we're going to take an even, even deeper look at this idea of capitalism and how we organize our economy. So now I want to break down just a couple of definitions for you, kind of some essential info that we're going to be able to talk about more in class. And first is the definition of what capital is. Capital is money or assets that are used in a business to create more wealth. This could be cash that you use to pay employees or purchase things. It can be chemicals that you can turn into different products you can sell. It could be raw materials that you could either manufacture into different things or sell just the raw material, factory machines, and any finished products that you're ready to sell. So all capital is money or assets used to create more money. Now I want to talk real quick about currency. And what currency is, it's a system of money and it's a measure of value. It's hard to determine trade values, how many pigs it takes to equal a bushel of wheat or anything like that. So we use currency because it's a common way to measure value and it makes it easy to exchange goods and services. Now, currency is affected by inflation and deflation. Inflation is where the money of value actually goes down. And what cost 50 cents today could cost a dollar tomorrow. And this happens when there's too much money in circulation, either from loans or because the government has printed too much of it. Money works in the same principle of supply and demand. Imagine if there was only one dollar in the entire class amongst 25 of you. One cent would be worth a lot more than if there was $100 in the class. And so inflation means that the money you have is actually going to be worth less money over time. But then there's also deflation, which is the exact opposite, 
where prices go down, but there is less money, and so money is harder to get. And we're going to talk in more detail about all of these concepts more throughout the year. So also real quick, I want to talk about what a capitalist and an entrepreneur are. A capitalist is a person who uses extra money or resources, capital, to invest in a business in order to try to make more profits. Now, a capitalist does not operate a business. They are not the person who runs it. All they do is they loan money or invest money into a business, and then they hope to get profits if that business does well. This is different than an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is a person who's going to own and operate their own business. And oftentimes this means risking their own money or taking out loans and taking on personal debt in order to start a new business. Entrepreneurs are usually characterized by a new product, invention, or service, or doing an existing service or making an existing product better. But an entrepreneur is someone who owns and is in charge of and operates the business. So I talked a lot about investments. Here's what investments are. Investments is when you put money into a business in the hopes of making more money in the future. So the idea is that if I gave you $20 to make cookies, then I would get a percentage of the money that you got from selling those cookies. Because I invested in you, I gave you the money that you needed in order to create these cookies to sell them. Next, I want to talk very briefly about corporations and stock. This is going to be a bit confusing, so we'll make sure to ask plenty of questions about this next week. But a corporation is a legal entity. Basically, it's an imaginary person. It's a hard idea to wrap your mind around that owns a company. The idea is that a person personally does not want to own a company because then they are liable, meaning they can be sued if the company goes bankrupt or if somebody gets hurt. So what a corporation does is it protects the people who own it from liability and lawsuits it allows for the selling of shares of stock, meaning that you can sell pieces of your business for money. And then it ensures the company does not die with any real person. So for instance, Apple is still around without Steve Jobs. JP Morgan Chase Bank is still around, even though JP Morgan has been dead for a very long time. And so corporations sell what is known as stock. And what stock is, is a stock is a piece of a company. So if you buy a piece of a company, it makes you a part owner, and it entitles you to a portion of the profits they are going to be known as dividends. Basically, this means they divide up the profits among the number of stock, and then they pay out to the individual shareholders. Then finally, I want to talk real briefly about something known as the money cycle. And this explains how money, wealth, capital moves through a society. And it goes in a cycle that looks something like this. It starts with investments. Either you take out a loan or you take money out of your own savings, money that you put away, or you can go to capitalists and ask them to invest in your business. Once you have the money that you need to start a business, either your own personal money or capitalism, you can then start your business. Once you start your business, you want to create and expand it. Maybe you set up a corner store. Maybe you invent a product that does something unique. Maybe you come up with a new design of shoe, but whatever it is, you're creating something that you believe people are going to want or need in their lives. Well, once you have a business, you have to hire people to work for you or you need to pay yourself. And so from these businesses comes our jobs and wages, kind of our everyday people who are going to be kind of receiving money for doing work in businesses. Then they take that money and they go shopping. This is called consumption. You go to the grocery store and you buy groceries. You go to the store to buy clothes or whatever it is. You are actually taking that money you got from your wages and you're spending it on stuff. When you spend it on stuff, it is good for those businesses that you are spending money at. And so eventually that all ends in profits for business. And then finally, once the money cycle gets all the way around, those profits are either spent, taken by the person who owns the company, or they're reinvested in the business, maybe hiring more people or inventing a new product, and the cycle starts over again. And so that is kind of how money is going to move through the economy. Now, there's a lot of different ideas about how all this works. 
how economy works best and the role of the government in managing this economy because this all seems kind of this all may seem kind of loose to you but we're not going to talk about these two guys today we will later but we won't talk about them today so if you've had enough too bad because we're going to be looking at these concepts and many others in more detail throughout the year but for now we're going to stop our discussion of the basic economics your introduction to this lens and so I'm sure you have plenty of questions and I want to answer them to the best of my ability so please go to the office 365 survey link and post at least two questions that you have from this lecture that you would like me to talk more about next week in class